Here's some help with the Experiment 9 post lab. The first question says indicate the effect of each of the following procedural mistakes on the reported concentration of the solution. Is the reported concentration too high, too low, or unaffected? So case A says the burette was rinsed with deionized water and not washed with sodium hydroxide solution before being filled for the titration. Okay, well, if you rinse with water and not with sodium hydroxide, then when you eventually do pour the sodium hydroxide in, it's going to mix with whatever little drops of water you weren't able to drain out. And that is going to give you a diluted solution at NaOH. So it's not going to be as strong or as concentrated. That means that you'll have to add more of it to neutralize the acid in the analyte. So if you add more of that, then you're going to think that you actually had more acid that needed to be neutralized, right? Because you're not taking that dilution into account. You're assuming that it's not diluted when it actually is. And so the reason for that, remember, is because in a titration, the end point is when uh, you assume that the amount of hydroxide and the amount of H plus are the same. So if you had to add more sodium hydroxide, you would assume that you had more acid in the analyte. And so the reported concentration would be too high. For case B, it says the endpoint was exceeded by about three drops of titrant, and the titrant here is the sodium hydroxide. So if you did that, then you would have added more milliliters of sodium hydroxide than you should have. And therefore, you would think that there was more acid that needed to be neutralized than there really was, right? Because you're assuming that however much NaOH you add, that's how much H plus was there. So if you add too much OH, you'll think there was too much H plus, and the reported concentration would be too high. The reported concentration of the acid of H plus in the analyte would be too high. Case C says a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution adhere to the inside of the burette because it was dirty. And so if that happens, uh, you would think that you dispensed that NaOH into the analyte. It's not in what you're reading, which is the solution up into the meniscus. It's outside of that. It's still in the burette, but you aren't taking that into account. You're thinking that it went into the analyte. That's the reason why it's not below the meniscus anymore. And so you would think you added more NaOH to the analyte, which again means you would think that you had more acid that needed to be neutralized. You're assuming that however much NaOH is not in your reading of the meniscus that was added to the analyte to, be, to neutralize it. So again, you would have added, you would think you added more NaOH than you actually did, which means that you would think you had more acid that needed to be neutralized than you actually did, and the reported concentration of the acid would be too high. Case D says the student did not remove air bubbles from the burette tip before reading the initial volume. So if that happened, when you actually added that bubble of air, you would think you were adding NaOH in terms of the change in the volume in the burette. So the change in the volume would be bigger. You really just added air, but you would think it was NaOH. So you'd think you added more NaOH than you actually did, which means you would think that you needed to neutralize more acid than there actually was. Because again, you're assuming that those are the same at the end point or the equivalence point of the titration. And so again, the report concentration would be too high of the acid in the analyte. Question two says, why does the pink color, which forms at the point where the sodium hydroxide comes into contact with the phenolphthalein in the flask, disappear more slowly near the end point? Now, phenolphthalein only turns pink in a basic solution. And you would think that all the liquid in that Air Le Mer flask that here the scientist is holding, you would think all that liquid is homogeneous, but of course it's not. There are truly oceans and planets worth of oceans of 
molecules in that Air Mer flask. And just like there are currents in the ocean and different, con different uh, concentrations of things in different parts of the ocean, so likewise in different parts of the flask there are different concentrations of things. When you first pour a little bit of sodium hydroxide into that flask, that part turns pink. So here on this picture on the left, this part that's pink, that's where a base like sodium hydroxide was just added. Now, as that base mixes with acid around it, it's neutralized. An acid plus a base will give you a salt and water, and so you won't have that base anymore. If the solution is not basic, phenolphthalein won't be pink. So when the base is first added, it'll be pink just where the base is, but as the base is neutralized, it'll turn clear. Now at first, that will happen very, very quickly, because there's a lot of acid in the Air Le Mer flask to neutralize the base. So the, the base will be neutralized fast, the pink will go away fast. But as you do the titration, the acid is neutralizing more and more base, so there's less and less acid left. And it takes longer for the base that you add to find an acid molecule to neutralize it. And so that pink that you get when you add the base will take longer and longer to go away because it'll take that drop of base will take longer and longer to find an acid molecule to neutralize it. So that's why the phenolphthalein in the flask disappears more slowly as you get closer to the end point. Question three says, why might the color from the indicator slowly disappear even after all acid is titrated? So you finish adding your, your base and it's dark pink. You leave it on the desk for say a half hour and suddenly it's a really much lighter pink. Why is that happening? Well, if it's becoming a, li a lighter pink, that means the solution is becoming more acidic, right? Phenolphthalein is a pink in basic solution. And if it's pink, your solution's basic. But if you let it sit and it gets lighter, becomes clear, that means your solution is becoming more acidic. So how is the solution to which you're not adding anything, it seems, becoming more acidic? And the answer to that has to do with carbon dioxide. So just like I mentioned how there were these huge oceans of molecules in this flask, there are huge numbers of carbon dioxide molecules, millions upon millions of them, crashing into that to those to that the liquid in that flask the water into that flask like meteors into an ocean and when it crashes into it the car some of the carbon dioxide molecules react with the water to become a new molecule h2co3 notice how you have two h's there just like you have in h2o on the left one carbon like in carbon dioxide and three oxygens just like you have from the two in carbon dioxide and the one in water on the left now that molecule, H2CO3, is called carbonic acid. It's an acid. And so as carbon dioxide reacts with the water and creates an acid, it makes the solution more acidic, and therefore it makes the pink color get lighter and lighter, because phenolphthalein is only dark pink in a basic solution. As, as carbon dioxide dissolves, it produces an acid which neutralizes the base, and so you have less and less base there, and so the solution gets a lighter and lighter pink. Now, this is an interest, a really fascinating reaction because it's responsible for a number of things that we see in life. Because as raindrops fall from the air, they react with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and they create this carbonic acid. That's the reason why rain is slightly acidic. Now, here's an example of this happening. We exhale carbon dioxide. So you can see this carbon dioxide is going to react with the water and make the solution more acidic. It's going to make that carbonic acid. And as it gets more acidic, it's going to turn a lighter and lighter pink until it gets completely clear. So this is interesting because acid dissolves lots of stones, but one stone in particular, calcium carbonate, which is both marble and also just a stone that exists on the ground. Here's a, a sample of white calcium carbonate. You can add any acid that, and it would dissolve this. Here I'll add HCl, just for the sake of demonstration. And you see that in the presence of an acid, that solid rock, calcium carbonate, dissolved.
So as acid rain hits solid calcium carbonate, that dissolves too. Now that's that happens with marble. So in marble statues, as acid rain runs over the marble statue, the marble, marble statue will dissolve. Really, it'll be this H2CO3. Right When the carbon dioxide in the air reacts with the water in a raindrop, it has this H2CO3 in it. When it hits the marble, the marble dissolves in these creases here, wherever the, the raindrops tended to collect most. And that's also how caves form, because there's calcium carbonate in the ground. And as the rain, the slightly acidic calcium, the carbonic acid, water seeps into the ground, it'll dissolve anywhere that there's calcium carbonate in the ground. And if you have these chunks of calcium carbonate, uh, where as the water, as more and more acidic water reaches it, more and more will dissolve, and you'll get caves. This is a particularly interesting cave. It's the Great Blue Hole in Belize. It's interesting because it has the characteristic features of caves, which are stalactites and stalagmites, which take hundreds of thousands of years to form. But it's underwater. So that, meant, that means that this was once above water. Otherwise, these stalagmites and stalactites couldn't have formed. And then the ocean level rose to the point where it engulfed the cave. And now people can scuba dive in it. This is another example of a cave, beautiful cave of the crystals. I think the biggest crystal that they found was 39 feet long and 4 feet in diameter. Question 4 says, why is it a good idea to carry out titrations in triplicate? So this is really to get a more accurate or more precise result. Um, and so first, if you get two data points, if you calculate, do it, uh, if you repeat a uh, an experiment twice, then you can get a line. But if you experiment, if you repeat an experiment three times, then you can get a trend and a sense of how much deviation there is from that trend. So it's good to carry out experiments like titrations in triplicate because it gives you the sense both of a trend and of the error that you might have in experimenting to find that trend.